Hey, basketball fans. Welcome to a brand new episode, episode 10, in fact, of your favorite WNBA YouTube show, Around the Rim. I'm your host, LaChina Robinson, co-host, that is, joined by my co-host, Tarika foster Brasby. Hey, T. Looking real peaceful, but we're going to get down to that in a moment. Um, this is all about the WNBA playoffs. We just finished round one. We are going to look ahead to the semifinals. So let's just start with the fact that all four of the top seeds moved on. There weren't any upsets, even though we did have a couple rounds, uh, a series go to game threes. And we'll get to that in a moment. But uh, Vegas, Chicago, Connecticut, and Seattle all moved on. So the semifinals start this Sunday. We'll give you times and game slots and all that stuff in a moment. But let's just start with this text that I got at 12... 06 a.m. Now, mind you, I just said I got the text at 12.06 a.m. And despite that, I just got like chewed for not responding as if I was doing something weird when it was the wee hours of the morning. I mean, I received the following text from one Tarika. What's your middle name, Tarika? Michelle. Tarika <laughs> in Foster Brasby. <laughs> and it says, I thought I was going to need an ambulance for a minute there, but no emergency services are required. If you know Tarika, you know that whenever the Connecticut Sun are playing, Tarika is in a way. And last night, Dallas had pushed Connecticut to a game three, a decisive game three on the road. Remember, we told y'all about that new format. It was top seed, home, home, and then game three away. Well, Connecticut lost game two, so they had to go to Dallas to try to clinch the series. Tarika, why were you going wild on my text messages about this game? I just want to say, first of all, that LaChina was in central time zone, so it was really only like 11 her time. No, you were up at midnight. That was the problem. I was. You I were was. up at midnight in my text message. <laughs> I was. I was. Okay. I just wanted to be clear that I was concerned about Connecticut because the first half of the game, although if you look at the final score, you might be like, wow, this was, you know, pretty a handily win for Connecticut. It was not not in any way, shape, or form, or fashion, because the first half of this game, I literally almost pulled all of the hair out of my wig. I could not believe several things. One, shot selections were poor. Uh, number two, John Quill Jones had three fouls by the end of the, by the middle of the second quarter. Mm -hmm. Couldn't believe it. Um, number three, they were being completely bodied defensively by Dallas inside um I I I did not know whether or not this was going to be yet another season that Connecticut was going to walk away without having reached the WNBA finals and I thought I was going to need to call 911 because everything was making me frustrated as I'm sure the players were also frustrated so yeah I needed I thought I was going to need some emergency services but my girls figured it out and I have to give credit to Vicki Johnson, too, because her in-game and pre-game adjustments, like starting Isabel Harrison over Tierra McCowan. Big change in the series. Was not ready for it. They were yep. not ready for it. The other thing that happened, which was unfortunate for the Wings, is Izzy Harrison went down. You mentioned that change to the starting lineup, which was so good for Dallas because mm -hmm. Izzy was now an option. She had scored a bucket early, mm -hmm. given John Quell issues. She goes down with a very unfortunate ankle injury, is not able to return to the game. And I thought that was one of the things that changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that absolutely. She was she was smothering. Like her defensively, she was smothering. And just the the pace of the game is just so much quicker for Dallas when you have Izzy in versus when you have to start Tierra. And so her going down, I felt so bad because this was yet another, you know another blow for Dallas who was already starting this game without Arike, even though Arike was available and could have played you and I both know that minutes restriction was going to be a factor and just her overall ability to really get in there and bump and grind with the people that were there. 
Vicki Johnson had a choice to make and she didn't bring her in until the third quarter. So it just was just another blow to a team that already had enough stacked against them from an injury perspective. Yeah, here's what I learned about Dallas. Okay. I kicked myself for saying that I didn't think that Dallas was going to make it in the playoffs. And I owed them an apology and I have on every episode since then. Mm-hmm. Marina Mabry stepped up in the absence of Arika Gumbawale. They seem to be like really maturing as a team. Vicky's got them on the same page. Last night, they showed a lot of that immaturity once again. And I only say that the word probably isn't immaturity. It was lack of experience. When things started going tough, they played like five separate players on the floor. You didn't feel that connectivity, that 28 assists that they put up in game two. You didn't feel that they were on the same page in that way. And you want to Connecticut credit Connecticut. Absolutely. But there were also some really bad shots taken some, mm-hmm. some turnovers that seemed unnecessary. Mm-hmm. If no one was able to really pull that team together. And again, Izzy's experience could have been something that made that happen Arike is like just trying to figure out if she can even play when she gets in there. Credit Vicki Johnson for, I thought she put her in at a good time. I mean, assuming she was warmed up, put her in there in the third quarter. You still got a whole quarter left if it's a disaster and you have a whole quarter left if it's not, right? right. Um, and I thought, so I thought that timing was good, but Dallas wilted under the pressure of Connecticut, literally and figuratively, Mm -hmm. but also they allowed it to show some level of inexperience and immaturity. So when it comes to games played in the playoffs coming into this series, the Sun had 166 games played and the Wings had 18. So very often they had it. They had a great season. They had a great season. Mm -hmm. All things considered, Satu not playing for most of the year. That's the other thing is with Izzy out, Satu had to kind of overextend herself. You could tell she's not quite yet strong, not quite there, but did a good job. I mean, she hadn't played in a while until the playoffs, so she tried. Um, You know, Arike being out obviously doesn't help them. So anyway, long story short, solid season for Dallas to – to build on but the question is how do we feel about Connecticut moving forward as they get ready to play the Chicago Sky now let's talk about the Sky side before we get to Connecticut (laughs) you mean you mean let's talk about making history (laughs) with these exceptional scoring wins that they have had over the last over this this season tell me about it Chicago has just really, gosh, I don't, they're, okay, so do you remember when, um, before this season, heading into last season, there was this um, notion around Connecticut of disrespect, right? Mm -hmm. And so last season, everyone was like, okay, you got to respect them. I feel like Chicago has now picked up this And not necessarily like they're saying that they have like a disrespect kind of thing going on, but I feel like their fan base and I feel like their players unintentionally are really starting to feel like they're disrespected. Like if you ever watch and listen to their fan base, they would tell you that people don't talk about them enough. They don't credit them enough. They don't get, you know, Candace Parker has played lights out, but she hasn't been in the top conversations with some of other players. Kalia Copper is another one who, you know, when it comes to being, we even had people criticize us on the show for saying that we disrespected Kalia Copper and what she's done. Yes. Can you want to see the comments? Girl, you know how we read. Yes. Yes. They said that we didn't give Kalia Copper enough love and that we disrespect her. I mean, like I, I feel like we are starting to kind of see that. And so when I see things like Allie Quigley saying we went into game one against New York with a regular season mentality, a regular season that remember they were already struggling down the stretch. I can kind of understand why that outcome ended up being the way it was. Keeping in mind, as we previously discussed, New York was playing very well at this time. Sabrina felt like she had something to prove, but Nigel Laney came into the game who had not played in a while, so no one had really had an opportunity to see what she was going to do. And I think that was the wake-up call 
that Chicago needed. And now here they are again, like, we gonna do better this time. We've got to do better this time. And by doing better, it was like a 30 some point win. What I'm interested in seeing as I look back on, first off, I think it's difficult to beat any teams five times. I mean, mm -hmm. I thought it was difficult to beat any team four times, but Chicago was able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but what I find to be interesting is that these matchups have been four points or less. Mm -hmm. And in many of these matchups, Connecticut has had the lead going into and nearing the end of the game with two minutes left in the fourth. Mm. This team had a two point lead. I mean, teams had, a, I want to say it was a six point lead with, no, it wasn't the fourth. It was with uh, two minutes left in overtime. They, oh, in their last match, they that. had a six point lead and lost it. So I'm not so much as concerned that Connecticut does not know how to match up with Chicago and play Chicago well. What is going to be interesting is how Connecticut figures out how to close because Chicago has shown they absolutely know how to close. They know how to close a game. And that's so important when it comes down to, you know, the last two minutes or less, when it comes down to who can continue to make the plays in the biggest moments, who can minimize mistakes in the biggest moments, who can not turn the ball over. Chicago's proven they've been able to do that against Connecticut. Connecticut has yet to show that they have been able to do it. And this is the opportunity for them to show that or they're going to be going home because that's really what it boils down to. It does. It does. Remember, I've talked about many times on the show that Connecticut has to start the game, has to start. They have to start well. And too many occasions they have not been able to do that. Last night was a perfect example mm -hmm. of that. Um, they had a stretch in that game where they went, what, almost seven minutes without a field goal. Mm -hmm. So being able to start the game well, offensively well, um, is is definitely something that Connecticut is going to need to do. But I would argue that Connecticut's post game when they're playing like when they when they when they want it when they play like it that's what drives them like yes their defense yes they their offense runs off their defense absolutely and we saw that in game two like they too too busy were trying to you know hit shots unnecessarily taking and they did a little bit of that yet last night in the beginning taking ill advised shots just because they were trying so hard to catch up and it's like play defense stick to what you do stick to your identity and it'll work but what I think concerns me is that they have the ability to do that against Chicago and have done it, but Chicago has way too many bigs that can shoot outside versus Connecticut. Not so much. Emma Mieseman is a shooter. <laughs> like she will bang you inside, but she will also hit you from the perimeter. You can get that from JJ. Not going to get that so much from Alyssa. You can get that from Bree, but maybe, you know, like she, she isn't really a perimeter scorer. She is an inside, back to the basket kind of kind of player. And so to me, that's, you know, one of the things that I think is going to be concerning. And also there's guard play. I think Natisha Heideman has done an amazing job this season. And I understand why Kurt Miller continues to argue for her in the most improved player conversation. She really has improved and stepped up her game. But you about to go against, you know, some true veteran mm -hmm guards Courtney Vandersloot Allie Quigley I mean like these are true veteran guards and so um there's there's certainly going to be some uh, adjustments that need to be made from an offensive standpoint when we don't usually talk about the uh of offensive prowess of Connecticut but they have the ability to score and they have the ability to score in multiple ways they just got to do it and I mean, it's really, and I know that's probably like not something anybody wants to hear, but it's really just that simple. You just got to do it. So let's go to the other series. See where you want to start. Girl, it don't do it matter. I mean, we could probably start with Las Vegas because they, they've been chilling for a minute. <laughs> they've been chilling for a minute. Okay. Um, who, how do we even quantify, you know, what we have seen from, Chelsea Gray, what we've seen from Asia Wilson, like how do we even quantify it? It just, it there, it just there is no words that can describe how well they played in that series against uh, Phoenix. 
And as we've, you know, said on multiple occasions, you got to give a lot of credit to Phoenix for even getting to the postseason, but they just were not ready. And I feel like they were abused. Yeah. <laughs> Lost. Las Vegas just abused them. But the- I will say wow. that there, I didn't love, I, I thought Vegas got some slow starts against Phoenix. Like I, there were a couple of times where I turned it on. And I was like, oh, first quarter is not even that, you know, or they're a quarter and a half in, like they eventually got their rhythm. But yeah. that's kind of was concerning to me because um, I would have loved to see Vegas just like rail them from beginning to end and not to take anything away from Phoenix. But to me, that was the gap at that point between those two teams and that Vegas could have just gone off. Um, And, and their defense has to be solid from like diamond. I think one game had like 20 points and a half or something like that. So there's, to me, there was a little bit concern, even though the end score was great for Vegas Um, defensively, they're about to face something else because Seattle and over to that side of the series, like they look crisp. And no one has really played this Seattle team. Maybe Vegas in that last game of the regular season, but like they're working on a whole new level. Sue getting double doubles, like Gabby hitting jump shots, Tina in the low block going cray. Well, wait, do I um maybe I missed this, but has she been cleared? Has she cleared protocol to play? She, she has not, but concussion protocol usually doesn't take and it depends on the person, but it, it can, right, right, right. Yes. But a week should be right. You would think enough time, but you're right. There's no Gabby that changes the series a lot because they need her for Chelsea gray. Cause Chelsea, who, who everybody didn't vote for her for all-star. She making everybody pay for it. Like I, she is playing at an out of this world level. So they're going to need Gabby to do something. Asia and and Stewie are going to kind of neutralize each other, but it's going to come back to the depth factor. And they got four number one picks now. They do. They do. They really got like a little mini UConn starting lineup going on. <laughs> they do have a little. What a, I know. What a, what so a, this coming. this this series for me is a straight toss up, and the Aces have home court advantage, and that's really what this could come down to. This really could come down to the fact that the Aces have home court advantage. Um, and they're going to need that crowd in a gang five. That's kind of how I'm feeling. Um, one thing that strikes me about this series too, is that I know both of these teams, you know, it's similar to how we, you know, thought we would see this out of Washington. Um, and I thought I was going to be right. I thought I was going to be right. Cause remember I said in their first, um, if Washington could take game one, they could, they could make some shake. Yes. Take game one. But anyway, um, the I, I think one thing that is is very interesting is, you know, and we always talk about how you don't really want to talk about regular season when it comes to the playoffs because it's just a different intensity that comes with playing in the playoffs. But if you talk to teams, they'll tell you that some of them in terms of their film, their preparation, like you don't want to make those kind of changes. You, you want to sh- try to stay as consistent as possible, right? And with that being said, I feel like Seattle is definitely a team that has played Las Vegas enough to know how to go into Las Vegas to try to get a win. And when you have a team that absolutely knows how to win on the road, whether that's in the team that you're playing or just having a decent road record in every other instance, I feel like that gives you a little extra boost of confidence. So I don't know how much home court advantage would be in Las Vegas as it is as opposed to if they still won in Las Vegas and having that home court advantage switched over to Climate Pledge Arena. I feel like that's the HC that could really make the difference. That place is going to be rocking because people are still turning out because they don't know if it's going to be Sue's last ride or not. And on top of that, just the atmosphere and the aura in that building. And oh, it's building. crazy. I was up in there. That thing I know, is right? Wild. Wild. So for me, I, I really feel like the home court advantage would swing to Seattle if they're able to steal one. And and, and they just have all the pieces that you and I have already mentioned to, to go in Las Vegas and take a game. So I could easily see this going to game three, standing at 1-1. Mm. See, I think we going 2-2-1. Two, two, I think we going Vegas, Vegas, Seattle, Seattle. 
toss up game five. Word, word, word. That's how I'm feeling, but we'll see. But I do want to give some love to the Washington Mystics because Elena Deladon put on a show in game one. Natasha Cloud was knocking down jump shots. That was part of Seattle's plan. They didn't want to let her be a passer, mm-hmm. um, but they gave us some great moments. Um, and I just wanted to give them, you know, a shout out because it's been a rough few years for the Mystics and that's my home team now. And it's been a few years since they've been in the playoffs and looked like this and, you know, like kind of got their feet wet, but you can tell they're still not there. And I don't know if it's that they're missing a piece or they just need time for this unit to gel. I haven't figured it out quite yet, but something when you put them against the roster of Seattle, now Vegas also and Chicago, do they have enough? Mm-hmm. Do they have enough firepower to contend with, four number one picks and three number one picks and uh, what we got going on. And and not that those numbers are everything, but Chicago's three finals MVPs in their lineup. Yeah. And they're don't get me wrong. Washington's super talented, but the way this league is headed, you got to have a lot of firepower. So I haven't figured out what that is, but anyway, want to send a shout out to them. Always great to cover Mike Tebow's teams. Um, yeah. And I know we have to wrap. So I wanted to each of us to give our key players from each team as we get ready to kick off the semifinals. An X factor in Chicago in, for Chicago is Rebecca Gardner. Hmm. I, I first shout out to her, first of all, for making the all rookie team. So deserving. Um, I feel like she brings a lot of energy when she comes into the game and she really does know how to be disruptive defensively. She gets in there and gets handles, sis gets steals. And you got to love that about her, that she's not afraid to to kind of be that aggressive on the defensive end. And I like that about her. And I feel like she is someone who can certainly, um, and she's not afraid to take big shots in big moments. Like if you need a bucket, you can definitely trust her, which is something that's so important for a rookie to be able to have that kind of trust from your teammates. So I think from um, Chicago, she's definitely the X factor for me. On the Connecticut side of the ball, we've both said it. You said it yesterday and I wasn't with you. I said it yesterday and you wasn't with me, but I said it on Christina Williams' show, um, Women's Sports Wednesdays, that Dewana Bonner has to be, like she has to show up and she has to score. She dropped 21 and she has to continue to to do that. When Dewana Bonner, Bonner isn't present, you feel it. And and she's someone who can literally bring experience and big shot moments. So gotta have Dewana for Las Vegas, a player who I don't want to know. I don't want to say she's necessarily an X factor because I just feel like they have so much firepower in their starting five already that you don't even really need an X factor. But if Kia Stokes is able to like really continue to like really step it up, um. I feel like she's that player that could truly make a difference for Las Vegas. Like you're already going to get, you know, the guard play from Chelsea and Kelsey and Jackie Young. You're all, you know, you're going to get, you know, 23, 25, maybe even 30 out of Asia, depending on what the day of the week is. I feel like Kia Stokes can bring that inside presence. She's big. She can block. Like she's someone who could really be like a turn of tide for this team if she's able to find herself and find her rhythm. Um, and I know it's going to be difficult. You know, I don't know if Dierica Hamby is ever going to be able to come back by the end of this season. She's been out two to four weeks. And I, I honestly don't remember what that timetable is right now, how long she's already been out. It may have only been a week or so. But I just think Kia Stokes is somebody who absolutely could be that X factor piece. Because, I mean, where do you go when you already have so many, so many powerful pieces on your chessboard already? Um, so that's hard for me. For Seattle, um, not necessarily a someone would think of as an X factor, but I'm going to go Jewel Lloyd. Hmm. I think Jewel Lloyd most certainly um, could be the difference maker for Seattle. Um, just There's just something about Jewel to me. She's like a silent assassin, honestly. I feel like people tend to forget about her, which I don't know how, but I just feel like people tend to forget about her. Like when you mentioned, you know, the, the Gabby Williams and what she does and Tina Charles and how she's been able to, you know, acclimate herself to that offense and Sue Bird still, you know, doing Sue Bird type things. I feel like Jewel Lloyd is 
seriously that person who is the silent assassin. Like she's there and you've got to respect and you've got to respect the game. But are you really checking for her? Like you should be, but are you? I don't know. So I think that would be my X factor for Seattle. It's got to be, it's got to be Jewel. If Jewel, yeah. if Jewel dropped 27 on y'all, this is a, listen, be careful, Las Vegas. Be careful. Uh, and Jewel is another one that I just love. Like her personality is so steady. Like, yeah. And talking to her and even listening to the, some of the stories, stories that Roz told about, you know, she interviewed Jill, Jewel and she talked about having a life coach and trusting her game and just the meditations and all the things that she does to keep herself zen and to stay in the right zone. Like I have so much respect for the work that Jewel does mentally and physically to stay, you know, at the top of her game. And, um, but really quickly, my X factors for Vegas, it's Kelsey Plum and, and Chelsea Gray. Um, defensively, um, you know, it, it's going to be important for them to be solid on defense, but then also, well, in, in, in the defense, being able to recognize what Seattle is doing and like helping their team to navigate some of their offenses because Seattle's offenses are like screen cut back, cut, mm -hmm. you know, flare, you mm -hmm. know, all these different motions, right? And they're just, they they just are have perfected it, especially with Jewel and Sue and Brianna Stewart. They read each other so well. So them being able to recognize actions defensively and help in that way um, is going to be important. And then for Seattle. Isn't it hard? Yeah, Seattle, I'm going Tina Charles. And I say Tina Charles because when you put the five up against the five, Tina ended up having to guard Deladon some, right? Like she ended up having to, they, that was one of the changes Seattle made to free up Stewie, mm -hmm. which would, ended up being a really good move because then Brianna could be more disruptive on defense and, you know, kind of play off a little bit. So Tina can score and defend. She may have to play Asia Wilson some, and she'll need to be solid there. But she'll also need to be able to score over Kia Stokes if that's who's guarding her or give buckets no matter what. She had some key rebounds in the matchup against Washington. Like, she did some little things I thought were effective. They went to her in the low block because, let's be honest, Tina's a future Hall of Famer. Right. Her footwork in the low post is exceptional. So right. they want to be able to go to her to stretch out some possessions in the half court to either command a double team or make a good pass out. But her continuing to like really do the little things, work hard and give Seattle that X factor is everything. Like they need Tina to be Tina in yeah. a big way in this matchup. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely could, couldn't see that and can agree with that. Um, you know, I thought Tina was going to be um, an X factor for this team coming into the first round when we talked about it. So I could definitely see that. I just don't, I really want this for Kia. I feel like she's just such a great person um, in terms of the little things that she does that doesn't always show up on the stat sheet. So, you know, that should be interesting with that, that inside presence. We will have to see. Well, fans, um, just so you know, the semifinals are starting this Sunday and we will give you the schedule really quickly on Sunday. Seattle's going to play Vegas at 4 p.m. Eastern time um, on ESPN. And then Chicago is going to play Connecticut at 8 p.m. Eastern time on ESPN 2. Wednesday, Seattle will play Vegas at 10 p.m. on ESPN 2. Connecticut will play Chicago at 8 p.m on ESPN2, and then me and Tarika will be back to tell you the rest of the schedule. But basically, it's Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday after that. But we will have another show next week. You can always hit us on Twitter at Around the Rim Pod. I am at LaChina Robinson. Tarika is going off about something during the games at She Knows Sports. So hit us up. Thanks for watching the show. I'm tired. I just got in from Vegas today. I'm tired, y'all. I'm tired too. I was too busy up at nap. midnight fussing. Yeah, you up at midnight texting me. I'm trying to. <sighs> That's it, y'all. Shout out to Drea, our amazing producer who puts up with us every week, going 55 minutes over our time and ranting about WNBA. We appreciate you, Drea. All right, y'all. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>